and good morning from the art room. We are nearing the end of the clay unit, and before we do, we should take some time to pay homage to the masters. So I've made a list of the top five clay masters of all time. Let's check it out. Number five on my list of top five pottery masters is Berlin Craig. He grew up not far from where I grew up in North Carolina. For several hundred years, the Catawba River Valley in Piedmont, North Carolina, has supplied many potters with good quality clay. From the time of the settlers on into the 1930s, this part of Lincoln County has been the site of dozens of pottery shops. Now there is only one at the home of Berlin Craig. Berlin is the last active folk potter in North Carolina. For more than 50 years, he has kept to the traditional methods of digging his own clay, mixing it, making his own glaze, and firing a variety of stoneware pots. Besides maintaining an ample wood pile, he must keep on hand a supply of clay that is ready to be worked. Berlin digs his clay in a swamp along the Catawba River, laboriously hauling it out in five-gallon buckets and a wheelbarrow. What kind of clay is this? This is what they call stoneware clay. They claim that uh, they, the tale is that the Indians found it uh, where the buffalo crossed the river. The Indians got clay there to make pipes and dishes and stuff mm. before the white men. What we call the old Rhodes clay hole. People have been getting clay there probably for, well, for 200 years maybe, probably longer. The clay now is hard, dried lumps and must be soaked before it can be put in a mixer called a pug mill. The pug mill grinds the clay to a consistency suitable for turning a pot. Berlin used to use a mule to grind the clay, but he says the mule got too expensive to keep. So now he uses his tractor, rigged together with a truck rear end and a big pulley wheel to turn the mixing blade. Berlin told me how, as a boy, he had seen the big wheel in a hydroelectric generating plant. Years later, he had rescued it from a scrap pile in a farmer's field to use here. In just about 10 minutes, the pug mill turns out clay ready for use. I was raised up the road here about two miles on a farm, and my father had, we, we farmed, had mules, and this neighbor out here made pottery. And I got to grind in his clay. He didn't have a mule, and I got taking my dad's mule and, and uh, grind in his clay for it when I was about 12, and I got interested in it. I'd make me a 25 cents for bringing the mule down and grinding a couple of mules of clay for it. And I got interested in the turning then, and I got to turning started turning when I was about 14. Uh, we divided what profit there was. But then after he got disabled to work and I went to work for the Reinhardt's, I worked for so much a gallon turned for two cents a gallon. I'd turn about a hundred gallons a day, make two dollars. That was better than working at the sawmill for a dollar a day. The designs Berlin uses for his pottery are a mixture of tradition and his own ideas. He is perhaps best known for his face jugs. Sometimes I'll try to copy somebody that I saw or something, but most of the time I, I just make a face. Jug. Well, you gotta love Berlin Craig. My next pick for top five potters is Maria Martinez. Let's check out the video. There is nothing that is at once so simple and beautiful as a piece of well-made pottery. It represents one of man's most ancient skills. A few, such as Maria Martinez and her son Popovi Day, raised pottery making to a high and respected art. 
Near their home in the Pueblo of San Ildefonso in the Black Mesa country of New Mexico, Maria and Popovi Day gather the clay with which to make their celebrated black pottery. Water is added, is slowly and carefully worked into the clay until the mass is pliable. Next, strong and experienced hands knead the clay, pounding, dividing, pressing. Air bubbles are worked out and the mass becomes cohesive and smooth. This step is deceptive in that it appears simple. Strength and dexterity as well as experience are required to properly judge the condition of the clay. Finally, the clay is ready for use. A ball of clay is flattened, tortilla-like, and set onto a supporting base called a pokey. Coils are made by rolling the clay between the palms. These rope coils, as they're called, are used to build up the walls of the pottery piece. The more coils, the higher or larger the piece. Care is taken to pinch the coils tightly together so as not to entrap air bubbles. Shaped pottery is taken out to air dry in the sun, and nothing more is done until the piece is completely dry. The tradition and skill that Maria Martinez works with is amazing, and that's why she was my fourth pick. Now, let's look at our third pick. A potter named Peter Volkos. Peter Volkos broke with tradition to create pottery that was wildly creative and bold. He was in the Air Force. He was a gunner on a plane. And I think when he came out, he had a chance to go to the GI Bill to actually do something. I think Pete never thought of not working with his hand. When I went to school, I studied painting. I, was, I wanted to be a painter. But I was forced into a, doing a clay course, you know, to get out of school. So I took that class. And that completely changed my life, right there. As soon as I started feeling that clay, that was a big change for me. I couldn't paint anymore. It was just gone, completely. He first starts off with a really tight idea of what pottery is. He's making pots that we're familiar with, like well-crafted pots, well-designed pots. They look like the pots that we expect but he starts pushing against those borders, he starts pushing against the conventions. In 53, he had an experience at Black Mountain College where he met John Cage, Rauschenberg, and other East Coast abstract expressionists who like blew his mind away. It was the first time I'd heard a poetry reading, first time I'd seen modern dance happen. So it was a big revelation to me and my mouth was just open all the time. His experiences of war, his time in school to find the material he was always meant to work with, and the idea of furthering his mind intellectually allowed Volkus to set his work on a new path to think of his work not as functional anymore, but as sculptural. The whole idea of not just making a pot or a vase or a teapot was like incredible. You know, because suddenly you realize you could do anything. And that's what Pete's uh, philosophy was. He cuts into them. He violates their vesselness, which is against the law in ceramics. And this body of work really upset the field. You were either on the functional end or are now on this revolutionary sculptural end. My number two pick for top pottery masters is Li Hang Gu. 
he is a master of the Korean pottery style known as Aicheon. And finally, my number one pick for top ceramic masters are these Japanese potters. The video did not name them, but their ability to work with skill and create pots of such an amazing size is incredible. And that's why they're in the top spot. The method for creating such a pot on the wheel involves a combination of coiling and throwing. After the first lump of clay has been flattened for a base, the potter works with large coils of moist clay which have been rolled by an assistant. These are three to four inches in diameter. Coils are vigorously and precisely knitted together under the potter's skillful hand. Then water is added for lubrication and the throwing stage begins. Because of the great size of the piece, it is impossible for the potter to kick his own wheel so a helper supplies the power necessary to maintain the lightweight wooden wheel at an even speed. This particular pot will hold 300 gallons and weighs 600 pounds. When the pot has been finished on the wheel, it must be dried and fired. Most of the kilns in Japan are built of fire brick and insulated with mixtures of clay and straw. And there you have it, my top five picks for Pottery Masters. I hope that inspired you. Now let's get busy.